I want to start by saying that I believe in God. <laughs> wow, that's a good start, man. <laughs> We're glad you're preaching to us, yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a Christian church. Oh, that's one. I thought it was something else. I believe in God. I believe in God with all my heart. And I believe, I believe in a God who is able to take any person's life and transform it. I believe in a God who can take someone that we would never put our money on, would never think God could use. I believe in a God that sees people that we don't see. I believe in a God that sees the weakest people in, in our world and is able to make them the strongest people. We kind of isolate people in the groups who we hang out with, who are more comfortable being around, who we think is fun to be around, who we think is cool, who we think, you know, you know what I'm saying? But God, God doesn't do that. God, in fact, sees, sees us way different than we see ourselves and sees the pe people around us way different than we see them. If we look in the Bible from Genesis to the last book in the Bible, we always will see groups of people or a specific person that God encounters, reveals himself to, begins to use. And in those, in, in, in those seasons in, of history or, the, or that moment in time, you would never, we're just, we, we just read the Bible and we're used to those stories. But when we look at the background of those stories, when we look at who these people are, where they came from, even God setting apart the Jewish nation, making the Jewish nation. This is, these are like the nobodies in that time. These are people that were most commonly slaves, uh, a part of big empires, uh, doing all the hard labor and work, and God is setting these, these people apart. And, and I can give you a lot of examples where there's just people that we now look, like, look at as heroes in the Bible, but we're not heroes in the Bible. In fact, they were nobodies, they were not important, they were not uh, looked upon as someone that is strong, that is talented, that can lead, that is, that is supposed to be a king. Remember, remember David. David is probably one of my favorite people in the Bible, but I love to think about David when he's a young boy and nobody even knows, knows the dude. We, you know, King David, a man after God's heart, you know, the, the, the slayer of giants and, and leading a nation, one of, the only people, one of the only figures in the Old Testament who played the role of a priest, a king, and a prophet. Mighty, mighty man of God, a young man who was shepherding sheep in the hills of nowhere. But God saw that young man, encountered that young man, began to set that young man apart, and then begin to mightily use that young man. I believe in a God that can take any person's life, can take any individual, in fact, can take people that we least expect and begin to reveal himself to them and begin to use them mightily for his glory. I believe in a God. I don't just believe in mental conversion where we come to church and we just begin to believe what the preacher preaches and then we just follow along like dumb sheep. I believe in transformation. I believe when we encounter God, we encounter the power of God, you're able to take a person who is broken, beat up, messed up, and dirty, and God is able to take that person and make them an absolutely new creation. The power of Christianity is not that we have, a, have, have good morals and we have a good codex or a, or a reference to, uh, you know, script, we call scripture. And, and we follow this scripture and we're supposed to live a better life than anybody else in this world. I believe in a God who has, giving us a, who has given us a living word and this word can transform a person's life through the power of the Holy Spirit and take someone who is an addict and transform them into a holy, set apart son and daughter of God. I believe in a God that can take anybody's life and save them. Listen, to be a Christian is to be saved. It's not to be, thank God for our Christian families, thank God for the church that we're able to go to, but being a Christian means that you're saved. You've been saved by the power of God. We're gonna talk about some elementary things, but I'm gonna take, take this somewhere because I feel that there's so much more that God has for us. And I wanna share some things that are in my heart of what I see 
I see God doing in me, and I see God doing through our church, our youth, and reaching the people that are in our city, specifically young people. I believe, I believe in a God that is able to save and radically transform someone's life. Now, it's almost in certain areas become a part of culture just to go to church, right? Like, especially if you go to a, a more, you should say, I should say a more rel- relative, is that a right word? A more, yeah, a more relative church or someone, a church that's more progressive, a church that has a bunch of hipsters in it and cool worship leaders and, and, and preachers that can crack a lot of jokes and really, really pull every emotion out of you and then drop a bomb on you at the end and make you come to the altar. I say this with, with love in my heart. I see a generation that is being captivated, not by Jesus, but captivated by the culture of being a part of a cool church. And I think, I think God offers us so much more. I think, I think people that come into our circles, I think people that come to our church that are broken, that are addicts, that are, that are messed up, you know, one of the things, I'm going to share a little bit about how our church began and the things that started happening here. When, when Pastor Sergey got a word from God to start a church, he was about 20, I think 25 or 26 years old the first time that God had spoken to him, maybe a little bit earlier. And one of the things that God really placed on his heart is seeing, seeing young people come to the knowledge of God, being, being just salvations among young people. One of the reasons is when we, when the church began, and in that kind of in that season, a lot of the more conservative churches in our area um, had a lot of young people that were just getting sweet by the world. They had just moved to America. They had just kind of, you know, it's a harsh reality to encounter the culture of America and go to school and meet American youth and, and begin to visit the party scene and uh, getting into athletics, whatever it looked like, or, or a lot of, I know, I know like your older brothers and some of, some, of, some of the generation that was at Fort Vancouver or just in this area where it was like, there was like a Russian mafia there and the Mexican mafia and the Chinese mafia and just like these segregated groups of racists and, 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 and different cultures. And, you know, all the, black, all the Russian dudes have unbuttoned shirts and leather jackets. And, and when they talk, they have a heavy, heavy accent in English. And you can really tell they just got off the boat. And there was a, there was a huge wave of young people that had come here that were Slavic, that were in the churches that a lot of our families came out of, and they were getting just sweet by the world turning to drug addiction, turning, turning to the party scene, beginning to be dr- turning into drug dealers in our area that fast. Just a lot, a lot of really dark stuff that the youth begin to step into. And what's crazy is when our church started, one of the things that we saw in the beginning is radical salvations, specifically young people of Christian families that had got swept by bad crowds, drug abuse, alcohol, party scene, and were getting saved radically. One of... Um, one of, the, one, of the service, one of the services in our church, this young man who was really known in the Russian community in a bad way, uh, just had a crazy encounter with God and ended up getting saved at one of our services in the few, first couple years that our church had started. When he got saved, it started like a chain reaction because he, started, he brought his friend, he brought his group, they brought their friends, and all of a sudden we just saw a young person after young person getting saved in our church. pastor saw a vision in the beginning of our church where there was this, and I, want to, I don't want to go into all this detail. When he tells a story, you kind of get scared because he illustrates what this thing looked like, this beast. But he saw this scary, scary beast like out of a horror movie with, with like rows of teeth like a shark, really, really big blood-filled eyes. It was making all kinds of scary sounds, and out of its mouth were these ropes. In this vision, God, God showed pastor. Out of its mouth were these ropes that went out of its mouth and went out through our city and was tying people up 
and pulling them. Now, he at first, he at first saw the beast, then he at first saw it at a distance, these people that were tied up, didn't understand what was, what was going on in, the, in this vision. And all of a sudden, these people that are far away, they're kind of living their life, doing, doing whatever, uh, going to work, and kind of like they're tied up, but they're living life. And all of a sudden, in one moment, those ropes begin to all tighten, and everyone, they're living their life, but at the same time are being pulled towards this beast. And pastor already sees kind of the first set of people getting really close to being swallowed by this beast. And it's, he's like, I can't, I can't really explain what was happening in my heart and how real this was. And he's like, I just began to, he's like, all I could do is just begin to cry out, Jesus, save them. Lord, save them. And as he began to call on, on God's name and begin to ask for God to save these people, all of a sudden this sword from heaven, it's like a, just a flashing sword, strikes this beast on the head. And all those ropes that were entangling those people all of a sudden just disintegrate and turn to dust. And those people begin to run free. And God began to put very specifically in our pastor's heart that this church is not here just for the Russian community. This church is not just here for Russian families. This church is not just here for certain people groups. This church is here for the city. And the people that are in this city are going to come to know the truth, which is Jesus Christ, are going to come to know the goodness of God and the love of God and the grace of God, are going to encounter this God, this God who's able to set them free, who's able to change and transform their life and actually give them life. That they think they're living, but God's going to give them actual life. There is a difference, and we're going to see this difference more in these last days, of those that serve God and those that do not serve God. I think maybe some of us, if we're completely honest, we begin to feel some kind of trembling or shaking in our life when all this COVID stuff started happening, and, and life is changing really, really fast. If you think about what's changed just in the last four months and what could change in the next four months, it's crazy to think about. If we have come this far in just a matter of three to four months since COVID started in the beginning of March in the U.S., what could happen by the end of this year and the things that might be happening in our world come November and the elections and everything else, it could be insane what's going to be happening. And what, one of the things that's going to happen, according to the Bible, is that God's going to set apart those that actually serve him, that know him, and those that do not. Now, when, things, when times and seasons are good, it's easy kind of to blend in in church. And, and, wor and even worship and say amen and even be in a life group and be involved. But I believe with all my heart that there is so much more that God is, ha that is, that God is offering us and wanting us to step into that is not just church attendance, that is not just worship nights, that's not just I'm a part of a life group, but, a, but, but the reality of the relationship that God offers us that he wants us to step into in a much deeper and greater and more intimate way where God becomes everything in our life. Am I talking too much? Because I'm not done. I believe with all my heart that our God desires to reach the young generation in the city of Vancouver, Portland, and this entire metropolitan area. I believe in a God that's able to save people's lives and transform not just their, their life here on earth, but transform them eternally. You know, I think we all believe that. But we kind of don't. One of the things, one of the signs that we don't completely believe that, one of the signs that we are not on fire to see that, is when right now I had us pray for the city, had us pray for our young generation. Now, I want you to be honest. This is, this is kind of family talk Sunday. There isn't a burning desire that's consuming all of us as a body to see young people come to the knowledge of God. In fact, I think if we just keep gathering like this and have great services on Sunday and some of us are in life groups and some of us are involved, we consider this your, you consider this your home church or you go to another place, it's easy to get in this routine and just be okay now that God had saved me, now that God had reached me, I'm okay where I'm at, great. And we don't really take the responsibility of the people that are around us that still don't know God. This morning, 
After our, our, after our first service, one of our guys in, in the church, one of our leaders, has a young family and, and serves, on, serves in one of our teams. He just came up to me. He said, do you remember, and just named off like five, six people. Do you remember this person, this person, this person, and this person? And these are people that I met when I got saved in 2007 in this church that were there for a couple of years, but then for different reasons, whether it was sin, whether it was a bad crowd, whether it was kind of leaving our, leaving our area to a different place, but people that used to be here and used to go to our church that don't go here anymore. And in fact, it's, it's one thing that they don't go here anymore. They're not walking with God anymore. He said, you remember these people? I'm like, yeah, of course. I, of course I remember them. He said, lately, I don't know. Lately, I've just, these people have just been coming to mind. I'm praying. I'm spending time with God. I'm driving to work. And just these different people just start coming to mind, and I'm writing them down. He's like, I'm going to meet up with this person this week and this person. That's my goal. I'm praying for them, and I'm going to meet up with these two people that are still in our area but are not living with God at all. When we're open to what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in our life, and not just in our life, we're open to his leading in our life, he begins to lead us to this place where he puts people. It could be specific people like he did to him. It could just be people that we go to school with or go to work with. But people in our life, people in our city, he begins to place a responsibility. Like, maybe I should say this differently. We begin to have a burden and a compassion for these people, and we take on the responsibility of doing something about it. We begin to pray. We begin to reach out. We begin to go out on a coffee date, but we begin to take responsibility. And I think, and I'm not saying, you know, we're all horrible sinners and we don't care about our city and we don't care about young people, but I do want us to admit, I do, don't have to admit, I should say that differently. I do want us to acknowledge in our own heart that there is so much more that God wants to do in our life and through our life to the people that are around us. We focus a lot, we focus a lot on, and even me mentioning right now, kind of what's happening in our city, what's happening in our world. And maybe even putting, you know, saying things against liberals, saying thing against saying things against the left, saying things against people that are just insane insane in Portland and doing the riots. And we kind of wait in, in a sense, kind of waiting on the city to like wake up or change or like God, you know, these people really need you. These people are lost. These people are messed up. And we focus a lot on, we focus more on what we see happening in our city and how it's all bad and it, you know, it's not good and it, and it needs to change. But I want to offer one of the things that I wanted to mention today. I want to offer the fact that before we see a great move of God in our city, before we see transformation, before we see a wave of repentance upon our, upon our state, upon our country, that first the church needs to go through it. And if we, if we can actually stop looking at everything that's happening in the city and everything we see on social media and the news, and let's just look among us here. Let's look at our neighbor. Let's look at ourselves first. You know what I have come to terms with is that there is much, 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 much that, that God is trying to do and desiring to do within my life, within my heart. Not my neighbor, not Portland riots, not someone that's crazy that I meet on the street that, that you know, looks at me because I'm not wearing a mask and they are wearing a mask and they want to hit me in the face and I maybe want to hit them in the face. There is so much that God desires to do in me. first. In fact, I, took, I look at this last season as a blessing for the church because there are things that are shaking in the church. There are things that are being tested in the church, and we need to be aware that what's happening right now is more important, I would say, for the church than it is first for the city. 
that we need the shaking to, to really see where we're at, why we come here, why we gather together, what our relationship with God actually looks like, what is the substance of the faith that we claim we have, what is it that I actually carry between God and myself, what is it that I can offer to the people that are around me. And I think if we study, if we study at great moves of God, you will see that the people of God first go through a great fire before the city sees the fire of God. The Welsh Revival, probably one of the greatest revivals that happened in this last century in the world, in Wales, in the United Kingdom. Evan Roberts is one of the young guys that led this revival, but it's interesting to read the story of what happened to these young people. Now, if you, there's actually a lot of connection to the, some of the things that are happening right now. We think right now the world's crazier than it's ever been. The world's been just as crazy in different, in different eras of our, of our, you know, our history. But what, one of the things that was happening in Wales during that time, it was the late 18, beginning of the 1900s. What was happening in Wales in that time was the city was rampant with sin. Like I'm talking bars and breweries on every single block of the street. People people laying around, it was, it was more of a small town during that time, but this small town was infested with, with uh, breweries, infested with all kinds of prostitution and clubs, was infested. People, people were, were, almost every night you could walk the street and see people everywhere, drunk, passed out on the, on the, on the streets, on the, on, the front of their, on the front of their porches, on, on, on the sidewalks, people passed out everywhere. And almost everybody in that city would go to some kind of brewery or pub almost every evening. People were always getting drunk, always sleeping around. And it was just, it was, it was really, really bad what was happening there, in, 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 in other words. And what's crazy is there was a group of young people, Evan Roberts being one of them, that God began to set apart. They begin to seek God. God began to reveal himself to them, begin to set them apart, begin to put a burden and a compassion in their heart for their city. And what's crazy, they didn't go to the city and just out of nowhere tell them that they're all sinners and that they need to come to the knowledge of God and that they don't, if, they don't, if they don't stop sinning, they're all gonna die and go to hell. Now, fire and brimstone preaching, it works if you're led by the Holy Spirit and you're preaching to the right crowd. But that, didn't, that, didn't, that wouldn't work then. What they began to do is God just took them on a deep journey of praying. That's one of the things that I wanted to mention tonight, is God took them on a journey to just begin to pray. They begin to pray and they begin to cry out to God. Now, when there's a fire in our heart to see people saved, when we begin to pray together for it, when we begin to pray, begin to pray for it, there's gonna be a cry that comes out of our heart. It's not just gonna be, hey, let's pray for our city, and then you're, you're trying to you know, strum up the words and uh, feel the emotions and, uh, Lord, save our city, save our city. And if, if it's fake, it's, and, if, if, and if it's not fake, it's, it's maybe sincere, but that compassion, that burden's really not there. We're praying just to pray for our city, but there's not a fire in our heart to see people actually come to the knowledge of God. What's crazy is evangelism or reaching people or going out to, to reach people, it's not just something that we obey as a commandment in the Bible, which is a yes and amen, but it's something that God begins to take us on a journey on and we begin to have a burning, burning compassion, a burning desire for the presence of God and to see people come to that same knowledge of that presence. In other words, God takes us to, through that fire first before he brings that fire upon our area. Are you here? Now, thank God for our church. Thank God for every other local church. But there are more people outside of the church that are broken, addicted, messed up, deceived, lied to, depressed, uh, in fear, struggling in all kinds of addictions. There are more of those kind of people than there are more of God's people. And so there needs to be, God, I believe with all my heart that in Revelations when it says Jesus, Jesus is addressing, the angel is addressing one of the churches and he says, you have to return to the things that you used to do in the beginning. What's crazy is when he commends that church, they already have a great, healthy church. But what's crazy is when God speaks to that church that we would think is healthy and great and strong, God says, you have fallen from the first love and you need to return back to that place and begin to do the things that you did in the beginning. It's crazy, he connects, 
He connects the first love to how we live and how we act. The idea that we just love God and we just love people, but we live however we want is not according to the Bible. He says, go back to the first love and begin to do the things that you did in the beginning. Who believes with me here that God wants to touch our city? Somebody please shout amen. I believe God wants to touch our city. But, what, but if I'm honest, what I see is God wants to touch us. God wants to touch me. Sometimes I, I, I find myself, I'm going out, I'm doing the daily grind, whatever, and, and I, I understand the right thing to do. I understand what the Word of God teaches. But it's only me going into the presence of God that can really begin to transform me. I love what Max shared in his testimony about going to the natives. It's interesting if you listen to his testimony, what he said is the Holy Spirit began to place a burden on his heart. That we can't strum up on our own just to go out to our city, hey, and just go. And I believe in going in groups of two and preaching to people. But I believe for us to see the things that God has promised and the outpouring of his spirit in the last days is God first sets apart a people that are that are wholly devoted to him, that are set apart, that have a burning passion for him and, nothing, and for nothing else, that want to, see his, want to see his presence touch our city, that want to see his glory touch our city, and he begins to take them through this place. And when this begins to fill the heart of those young individuals, they begin to believe that God can touch their city. They begin to believe that God is about to touch their city. And that kind of prayer, what's crazy about the Welsh revival is this young group of people came into the city this one evening and all of a sudden the presence of God came down where they were and the people that were all around them began to be convicted of their sin. Think about this. They begin to pray, they begin to seek God, and begin, because of what God was doing in their heart, because of what God was doing among this group, when they came into the city together, I think they were, gonna, they were gonna hold like a courtyard service. They came into the city and all of a sudden, without any preaching, without any laying of hands, the presence of God came upon them in that place and the people experienced a great conviction of sin. People were literally falling on their knees right there, right there, just not understanding. No one's asking them to fall on their knees. No one's doing altar call. People are falling on their knees, falling on their face because the presence of God came into that place and the sin that is there is all of a sudden highlighted and you are afraid because this sin is not supposed to be there in the presence of God and people begin to shout screaming help me what can I do and there was a great repentance that began to weep, uh, sweep over the entire city I believe that God desires to reach every person in our city and touch the young generation in our city but I also understand that if God if I don't let God take me completely I won't see that. I can preach, I can talk about it, but if I don't let God take me there. What Mark was saying during his offering message is that maybe we give portions of our life to God, but God is waiting for us to give him all of our life. It is God who saves. It's the Holy Spirit that does the miracle working power of bringing salvation into someone's life. When the Holy Spirit begins to convict an individual, listen, not just me calling out the things that are wrong in their life, the Holy Spirit brings conviction into a person's life because the sin that's in their life, the Holy Spirit is showing them that's not supposed to be there. The holy presence of God begins to identify the evil in the individual's heart and he begins to understand first that he's a sinner, begins to understand second that there is a savior and begins to cry out for salvation. And a person that is being convicted by the Holy Spirit, responding to the goodness of God in that moment, is able to be transformed completely from being, from being a liberal, from being on the left, from being insane, from being mentally ill from being 
captivated by sin and, 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 and entertainment and lust and all kinds of things and is able to be set free by the power of God, begin to love God with all his heart, not just coming to church because now it's a cool thing to do or it's a cool church or they have good worship, but coming to God because he actually was saved, coming to God because there's actually something happening in him that God did that somebody was praying for. Are you here? I believe, I believe in the movement of God happening like that, where there is, there is, there is going to be a wave of repentance. Not just the following of, the, of a trend, not just the following of a good preacher, not just the, the attendance of a cool church that has a good worship team. I believe in a wave of repentance. It's a, it's a, it's a topic that gets really touchy with people that are in the world. You need to repent. Repent from what? And it's okay to have those conversations, but when we allow the Holy Spirit to take us to that place, when we begin to have a burning compassion in our heart, he first, he first sets me apart. what Ephesians 2 says and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in what in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience he has made us alive set us free from those things You know, when we talk, when we talk about praying, praying and seeking God and whatnot, and sometimes maybe you, maybe an individual here, um, it's in a sense maybe an a, a intimidating topic, one that makes you feel uncomfortable because prayer, prayer maybe is just a, a small little area in your life or maybe you just do it on the go. Maybe you are having a hard time in your prayer room. Uh, speaking to myself and, and kind of what I've been facing and seeing from, from me is if I, don't, if I don't allow God to take me to a deeper place of relationship with him, then what I see right now is what I'll continue to see. We never... We never ever see God in the Bible when he reveals himself to someone and they begin to grow in relationship with them. Until we, until we see how that person is used by God or the things that God does through their life, we first see an intimate relationship that begins to grow between that person, that individual, and God, where in that relationship, God is setting that individual apart. How can we reach, how can we reach a generation right now that is, that is wired in entertainment through social media if we are not set free from that first? How can we bring freedom to a generation that has lust to one another and anything that walks and looks good, I want and I want to get my hands on it. How can we bring freedom to that kind of person if I am not set free in that area? Or a generation struggling with laziness Wanting the easy way, wanting a good job that pays a lot of money so that I can do a lot of cool things in my life and do whatever I want with the rest of my time. How can we bring freedom to that kind of generation if we're not being oh, disciplined, if we're not being uh, wise with the time that we have in our life? Are you here? Some of you are laughing at each other and you just look at yourself right now. Look at yourself. Someone, someone's nudging, hey, he's talking about you. No, I'm talking about you, <laughs> not your neighbor. And, I, and, I, and I've, I've caught myself in the years that I've been a part of our church and maybe focusing so much on 
God's going to use you. God's got a plan for you. And I believe in that with all my heart. But what's more important than just to be used by God is to know God. It's to know Him. I don't want to offer to a young person, think about this. What do we, if we, we, do, we all want to see young people come to the knowledge of God. Yeah? yeah? I got three people that said amen. We want to see, we want to see a wave of young people in our city come to the knowledge of God. Are you here? Please. If this is not in your heart, let it be in your heart. We want to see a wave of young people come to the knowledge of God. A amen. 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 But when they come here, what do we offer them? You know what we offer them? Please, please, please join a life group. Please, please, please serve in a department. Please, please, please come to service on Sunday night. All good things. What else do we offer them? Come, I want you to talk with me right now. You can, you can shout at me right now. What else do we offer them? That's Ilya. Ilya's getting really spiritual right away. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Yes. How do we offer him Jesus? Community. What do we offer in that community? So if I bring somebody else, if I bring, if, if five people right now, you know, just coolios walk in, you know, hey, so, and they get saved, and they get saved. They get saved where right now the Holy Spirit just touches them. Like, imagine five guys running in right now. Hey, we want to give our life to the Lord. Can you imagine that? That was that's what was that was happening in the beginning of our church, where young people would just run in. Hey, so and so got saved. He preached to me. I'm afraid because I'm going to go to hell, and I want to give my life to the Lord. Now we don't be don't be judgmental on that kind of sermon on that kind of preaching, but I know a I know a testimony. This guy I know myself. He is now saved. His family serves God. He was he was like like that fob that Russian gangster who sat at Chakal of Starbucks, you know, every freaking day. Like how many coffees can you drink, bro? He was there every single day. <clears throat> you know what's crazy? A teenager came out of the Starbucks with this little cute latte. He probably, he probably had like a caramel frappuccino or something. Walked out walked out with this cute little drink, and he came up to this group of people. You know what he, you know, like he's a teenager and these guys are like early twenties, like, you know, they all drive the Benzes. You don't mess with these dudes. And he, 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 he goes specifically to this guy that I know who got saved. He's like, if you don't, I can't, I can't, I can't you're already saved, bro. Who's not saved? Who's not saved? Let me preach to you right now. Uh, if and he, this is, this is literally what he, if like, imagine hearing this, imagine like walking it. I can just imagine right now someone walking into the Starbucks who's like this, you know, new modern, modern Christian who like, you know, doesn't do that kind of evangelism. This teenager is like, if you don't repent for your sins, you're going to burn in hell. Now, don't, don't do this unless the Holy Spirit wants you to do that. But he walked out and he said, listen, God, God has plans for your guys' life. And he looks to one of them specifically. He's like, God, God's knocking on your heart. And if you don't stop living the way that you're living, you're going to end up in, an, in some kind of accident. Something's going to happen. And because of your sin, you're going to go to hell. And he just walked away. The guy couldn't sleep for two weeks. He's laying in his bed and he hears this teenager's voice in his head. If you don't get rid of that sin and come to God, you're going to go to hell. Fear began to fill his heart. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't get his sleep for two weeks. He, he, he would try to pass out because he's tired. He wakes up and he just keeps hearing those words. Wasn't enjoying the way he was living anymore. Became scared. Two weeks later, gave his life to the Lord. <laughs> Somebody tried that this week. But when we, when we bring them into our community, Alex said, what do we offer them? Think about this. What do we offer them? Prayer. Prayer? Hallelujah. Thank you. What else do we offer them? What will they see? What will they be able to receive? What can we give to them? The heart of the Father. The heart of the Father. You guys got some really good spiritual answers. I'm, 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 th I'm more practical. You know, do you know what we will give to them? We will give to them what we have. Oh my gosh. We will give to them what we have. 
If our, if our relationship with God and our church attendance have, has come down to being at services, being at life group, and being an usher, and I can't, I, there's nothing else that's spiritually going on in my life, that is the extent of what, that will, of, of what I will offer them. If all we know how to do is have, hear me please, hear my heart. If all we know how to do is offer them worship nights, that is all that we will give to them. But if we are taken to a deeper place by the Holy Spirit, to a place of relationship and knowledge of God, where God begins to take me on a journey of knowing him more, having a passion for him, where I don't care as much as being used by him as just to know him, then that is what I will give to them. And I believe we have a generation that doesn't just need to be busy in church, not just a generation that needs to be given an, a, a platform to, to function in their talents. All this is important. They need to come to know God. And they will come to know him if I really know him. We got to get real. Do I know God? Am I, am I seeking God in my prayer room every day? Or do I do it when I have time? I'm being convicted in this. Because I can't, I am busy. Those of you that are close in my life, you know my schedule. But I, it does not matter. One man said, I am too busy to not pray two hours at least. The priorities need to change. My, my walk with God, my relationship with God is first. And the Holy Spirit takes me there. Sometimes, listen, sometimes it's just a simple decision that you leave with when you leave here tonight. God, tomorrow, you first. You know, I, often at your age, I'd mess myself up because I, I had a, a plan to spend hours with God for like the next three months, you know? The next three months, I'm a, no one's gonna see me, I'm gonna crawl in my closet and just, just go deep, you know, just go deep. <laughs> it's like, what the heck are you talking about, bro? I'm just going to go, Paul went to the third heaven, I can do it too. I'm going to just stay there until clouds fill my room, until I hear the angels myself. I'm going to just go. I'm going to hear things that no one heard before, no I has seen before. I'm going to come out there with, my, you know, just, and I, and I would make this three-month plan of how I'm going to start seeking the face of God, just praying, fasting. I'm just going to be a spiritual beast, you know, it just... Maybe, maybe, maybe some of you ain't that crazy, but I think you've had some similar thoughts. You know, like you make plans to devote a season of prayer to God, you know, and then you devote freaking four days. Just do this. Can I help you? Devote tonight to God. And when you wake up tomorrow, right now, don't worry about tomorrow, but when you wake up tomorrow, and you wake up, devote that time to God. And as your day goes, do what you can to listen to the Holy Spirit. What you need to do more than anything else right now, with every distraction that's offered to you, everything that's being posted on social media, everything that you're seeing, just one day at a time, with a desire in your heart, God, I want to know you more. And make that decision every day. Just make it tonight. And when you wake up, make it tomorrow. Another thing is have people in your life that are making the same decision. I want to know God. I'm going to reach my friends. And your friends don't care about God. Let God reach you first. He's got no problem reaching them. He just needs to reach you first. One of the greatest hindrances to God actually working in us and working through us is ourselves. It's not Portland, it's not the riots, it's not COVID, it's not what's happening, it's not all the liberals, it's not social media, it's not everything that's being offered to me by the world, it's not the devil, it's me. Just me offering myself to God and saying, God, here I am. I wanna know you more. My number one goal is you. Young people, we need to set goals, we need to set, Paul told Timothy, physical training is good. You know, look at your buff neighbor, tell him physical training is good. <laughs> you know what else he said? He said, physical training is good, young, young, young man, Timothy, but spiritual training 
is much more important because it offers you benefits in this life and in the life to come. There's a life to come. And he says, in that life, the spiritual training that you go through, it'll be of benefit to you in the life to come. So, spiritual training, make a, make a, make a goal. That goal is the Lord. He is the first goal of our spiritual life, is I, Jesus, I want to know you. Amen. Amen. And I think, I think everything else really starts coming into place when that is first my goal. I, I, don't, I don't think when you, we, we will have to talk less about, hey, please join a life group. Please serve some people. Please invite someone that doesn't get invited anywhere. When you begin to grow with him, those things begin to naturally happen. Let's stand together. When Jesus addressed that church in, Eph in the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelations, he said, return to that place that you were at in the beginning. The, the, the biblical concept of remembering is really important because he, he tells that church, remember from where you have fallen. In other words, when God, when you first came to know me, when I just set you free, when I just saved you, remember that. Don't forget that. And then he says, after remembering, he says, you need to return to that place. And the, the, the means by which we return to that place is repentance. Now, we all are in agreement that we want to see a wave of repentance come, come upon our city. But I believe a wave of repentance needs to come upon the church first. It needs to come upon my life first. What do I need to repent from? Exactly. Just that. That's pride immediately. What do I need to repent from? It's pride. Whoa, I'm not really sinning. You'd be surprised. Holy Spirit I sense wants to take us through that's not something that I can do it's not something that I can please come right here to the front right now with me we're just all gonna repent but we need to we really need to get real with the fact that we say things like we want to see our city get saved but God is still trying to set some things free in our life and bring us to a deeper place of devotion and I'm hear me right he's not He's not needing to make you perfect before he can use you. He's trying to set you apart. Because God is always, it's a law that he has set in the Old Testament. And that testament has not, that, old, that law has not changed. It's that which is set apart unto God. That's what, that's what Mark, Mark just read out of Romans. Offer yourselves to me as a living sacrifice that is, that is acceptable unto the Lord. This is your true act of worship is a setting apart where you can't just say, you know, this is bad in my life and this is bad in my life and you make a plan how to change those things. But you just begin to come before God and you begin to seek God and the Holy Spirit is going to begin to bring conviction in certain areas of your life and lead you through this process, what we call sanctification. 
where he's setting us free from things and he's bringing us closer to himself. Where we are not just believing to be holy, not just believing that we're sons and daughters of God, but we're allowing the Holy Spirit to take us through that process and actually making us, making us, making us his sons who are set apart, making us his daughters who are set apart, making us a people that are ready to be used by him because we are allowing him to take us there first. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much for your presence here in this place, and I thank you for every young person that's here. Tonight, God, we're analyzing. Tonight, God, we are remembering. Maybe the place that we came from that you are asking us to return to. God, you promise that you will prepare your church to be without spot and without blemish. A pure church, clothed in white. You promise to do this, Lord. You promise to do this. And we trust in your word, God, and we trust in your Holy Spirit that is desiring to lead us. Lead us to a deeper place of relationship with God. Lead us to a deeper devotion with God. Where it doesn't, it's no longer just a part of my week. It's no longer just a part of my schedule. And I can't, God, I can't do this. I can't even just keep talking about this. This is something that you can only do through your Holy Spirit. And my prayer, God, my prayer is that every young person, every young person here, my prayer is that we as a church, as a body, as a team, would allow you, Holy Spirit, allow you to take us to that place. That we would look upon the place that we are standing now. That we would be honest with ourselves. That we would be sincere before you. That we would take that mask off. Take off maybe something that we're trying to hide between one another and just be open before you. And if there is a need of repentance, that we would allow the Holy Spirit to do that and just begin to repent in that area. If there, we understand, is a place we need to return back to. Maybe we have forsaken, forsaken our prayer room, forsaken your word, forsaken God. Maybe there isn't a, 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 a burning love in our heart for you, a desire for you more than other, other things in our life. Maybe we are distracted by the things that we are doing and our busy schedules and the things we're trying to pursue and achieve and, 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 and goals that we have. And maybe you are not that goal anymore, God. And we God, we just ask you to forgive us, God. We ask you, God, to bring us back to that place. We want our hearts, God, to be set apart for you. We want our hearts, God, to be on fire for you. We want God to repent. We want God for repentance to, to work through our life, work through our spirit. Where there are things in our life that you need to get rid of, that you want to rid us of, God, that you want to bring us to that deeper place. And we are willing to go there, God. Maybe there's things that we've been trying to change for years, trying to change, and we can't change them, and we just need you, Lord. We need you. We need you to take us to that place that we can't go on our own. Holy Spirit, I know that you are knocking. You're knocking on our heart. I know, Holy Spirit, that you are wanting us to hear, wanting us to hear. Listen, I'm at the door. I'm at the door. Would you just open it? Would you just open it and let me in? Let me in. Let me do what only I can do. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for being comfortable. Forgive us for being distracted. Forgive us for pointing the fingers at this city, for pointing the fingers at everything that's going wrong. Forgive us, God. Forgive us for forsaking our prayer rooms. Forgive us for forsaking your word. Forgive us for not being devoted unto you. Forgive us, Lord. God, we repent. We repent first for our sins before we pray for our city. We first repent for our sins. We repent, Lord, for our mistakes and the things that we, God, are not doing that are not pleasing to you. We say yes to you, God. 
We say yes to you, God. We say yes to you, Lord. If you sense if you sense that conviction you can kneel right where you are you can come to the front but I want us to take some time right now God gave us a promise he said if you would humble yourself and turn from your wicked ways and repent and call on my name I'm gonna hear you I'm gonna hear you if you sense that conviction it's not me telling you to do it you you sense that conviction of the Holy Spirit. You're coming to terms with certain things in your life and you're realizing, I, I need to repent for these areas. I need to repent and allow God to take me deeper. Respond to that conviction by repenting. Just cry out to God right now. Cry out to God. He's wanting to do something in your heart right now. In Jesus' name.
You might be looking at yourself and thinking your personal perception of yourself is I'm not I'm not very passionate for God I'm not really about prayer I'm not you know I understand what you're talking about it all sounds good but it's just maybe not for me I don't know I'm just a little bit different now I want to I want to tell you what we need what we need more than ever before for the fire of God to come upon our life. The Bible says that God is an all-consuming fire. He is an all-consuming fire. When you, go, when you grow in the knowledge of God and you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to do this in you, some of you are thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that, I'm not that type of person. I don't, I don't see myself doing that. You won't recognize yourself when the fire of God touches your life. When there's a burning passion in your heart for God, when there's a fire in your eyes, when there's a fire in your heart to know Him because the Holy Spirit has come upon your life, you're giving yourself to the Holy Spirit and He's leading you. That fire transforms you. 
You cannot be in the fire of God and stay the same. You cannot be in the fire of God and just leave, leave that place looking the same. In fact, some of the things that we try to break off of our life or habits we try to change or try to, or try to change who we are as people, it's changed in the moment when the fire of God comes upon our life. Pastor saw a vision. He saw a vision of a, a wall of fire in front of our young people. So in the first few years that we started youth ministry, he saw a wall of fire, a burning wall of fire all the way to the ceiling. He saw all of our young people lined up in front of this fire. And everyone was scared to come up to this fire, this wall. And he says it took just one, one, or, one or two people were standing in that crowd and all of a sudden they just begin to walk towards that fire. He says as they, as they would walk through that wall of fire, they'd be transformed into soldiers. They'd be transformed, clothed in white, just look like different people as they would walk through that fire. He said as a couple people begin to go and walk through that fire, a few more begin to follow them. And as those few more went, a few more begin to follow him. And one of the things that Pastor Slavik was received in the beginning of our in the beginning of the youth ministry he was given this advice he said don't worry about trying to keep young people or get young people to come to the service you just need to do one thing be burning for God and young people will always come just make sure that your heart is on fire for God and young people will always come We need to offer them what we have. And what we have is what God has given to us. His all-consuming fire that takes our life. It's in His fire, in His presence, where He, where he rids us of the things that are, that are just hanging around that we can't deal with or get rid of. It's right there in His presence. You are, sometimes I think, listen, we're trying to like become these prayer warriors, become these mighty men or women of God. We just need to let his fire consume. When his fire begins to consume our life in our, in our prayer closet, when we begin to seek his face, and right there, that fire, the Holy Spirit begins to touch us, begins to convict us, begins to speak to us, begins to, there's a, a burning passion in our heart that begins to grow for him. I want to return to that place. I was 20 years old, I'm at work with my dad, and any moment I had when my dad would walk away, I'm there in a construction site, I would hide behind a shear wall, behind some plywood, and I'd begin to pray in tongues, I'd begin to pray. Any moment I could, I'd just begin to pray. There was something happening in my heart, which the Holy Spirit does, I'm returning to that place. I want you to remember those, those moments when God touched you in the beginning, and there was just such, there was such a hunger for God, a prayer, a fire in your heart for God. It's not you making yourself, it's not you joining the crowd, it's not you being excited to worship, a desire in your heart for God, a burning passion in your heart for God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't work up in yourself to be better for God. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to take you. When the, when the fire of the Holy Spirit comes over your life, comes upon you, it's gonna do what you can't do. It's gonna burn things that don't need to be there. It's gonna burn things into your heart that need to be there. It's gonna begin to consume your eyes, consume your thoughts, consume your desires. It's the fire of God upon a generation. And God is gonna set a generation apart, not by good preaching, not by good worship, but by His Holy Spirit and the fire that comes upon them. I want you to step through that wall. I want you to step through that wall. If you're, if you're comfortable, if you're convenient, if you've been in the same place, agree with the Holy Spirit. I want you to take me through that fire. I want you to take me to a place of deeper devotion, deeper commitment. Light my heart on fire. Light me on fire for the Lord. I don't want to burn for this world and its lusts. I want to burn for you, God. I want to be set apart for you, God. I want to live only for you, God. I'm tired of pleasing my friends. I want to please you. I want you, I want you to see that I'm not joking around. My life is yours and I belong to you. Come on, begin to pray right there where you are. Holy Spirit, I pray for your fire right now to touch every individual who is willing to say yes to touch every young person who wants more. 
It's not me. It's not, it's not, it's not us just even being here. It's your desire, God, to set us apart. It's your desire to touch us with your Holy Spirit. The promise, the promise that we have received. It's not a one-time thing to speak in tongues. God, it's a, it's a river, a river that is flowing. It's a fire that you bring us into. God, I pray right now for every individual here that is not wanting to stay in the same place. And right now, I intercede for them. And I pray, Holy Spirit, touch them with your fire. Let your fire come upon their life. In Jesus' mighty name, every lukewarmness, every, every type of being comfortable and being convenient, I thank you that you're stirring up in their heart that they can't stay there anymore. And I pray, Holy Spirit, take them. Take them where they can't go on their own. Take them where they've been trying to be better, trying to pray, trying to be devoted. But I pray, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Take them to that place. Take them to that place. Take us, Holy Spirit. Take me, Holy Spirit. Take me to a deeper place. Set my heart on fire. Set my heart on fire. Let my desire be you. Let my passion be you. Consume us, Lord. Consume us, Lord. Consume us, Lord. Shut up, my son. Tell him, Baba, Baba, kill him, Baba, kill him, Baba. Shut up, my son. Tell him, Baba, Baba, kill him, Baba. Leave us, son. Tell him, Baba, Baba, kill him, Baba. Come on, I see an army. I see an army. I see an army. I see an army. Allow the fire of God to take you. Just agree, just agree with him. God, I want more. God, I want more. God, I want more. Shut up, my son, ten up, my baba, my kitty, book of Turamba. Shut up, my son, ten up, my baba, my kitty, book of Turamba. Ripa, son, ten up, my baba, shitty, book of Turamba. Ripa, son, ten up, my baba, my kitty, book of Turamba. Don't wait for tomorrow morning right now, press in. Don't wait for tomorrow morning right now, press in. Take us to our place, Holy Spirit. Consume us. Set us apart. We want our heart to be set on fire. We want our heart to be set on fire. No more burning for the lusts and passions of this world but burning for you, passionate for you, that your presence, you, Jesus, are our goal. Shut up, my son, ten up, baba, kitty, book of Turamba. Reba, son, ten up, baba, baba, cut it up. Shut up, my son, ten up, baba, cut it up.